So let's start with angles. First of all, I want you to know how to read and interpret the information that they're giving you about angles. So if you look at any given angle like this, for this example, there's several different ways that you can name the angle. And I don't think that you're going to be asked to rename an angle in a different way, but I want you to know all of these different ways that you're going to see it so you can identify which angle you're talking about. So the first way you can name an angle is with three points on the angle. So here, for example, you see we have angle ABC. Now what's important about this is that the vertex is B, so angle A, B, C. So of course the other way we could name that angle is C, B, A. The vertex must be the middle letter when you're naming an angle. And then of course there's a couple of easier ways to name an angle. One is just by a number, like angle 1, and that will always be indicated inside the angle. So if you see a number that's naming an angle, it must be on the interior or on the inside of the angle. And then the other way is you can name it with just the vertex. Now the only time that you're allowed to do this is when that angle is all by itself, when there's no other angles that have that vertex. So for example, if you had a diagram like this, you could not call either of those angles angle B. Alright, well let's move on to different types of angle pairs. The first one that you want to know and recognize is complementary angles. So complementary angles add up to 90, or 90 degrees. So a couple things that you're going to look for is that word complementary. One way that I teach students to remember which is complementary is complementary begins with a C. Really easy to turn that into a 9, 9 for 90. So complementary angles add up to 90. You're going to look for angles that add up to 90, or you're going to look for a right angle that's been divided into two different angles. When you're setting up equations, make sure you have something plus something equals 90. Remember, adds to 90 doesn't mean equals 90. You, mean, you must have a sum there. Okay, so our next type of angle pair are supplementary angles. And like complementary angles, you're going to find a sum, but these ones add up to 180. So here's a picture of what supplementary angles might look like. We have a straight line. We know a straight line is 180 degrees, so that's cut into two different angles, so those must add up to 180. And of course, 70 and 110 does add up to 180. Here's a little trick for remembering supplementary. Supplementary begins with an S. Easy to turn that into an 8. Reminds you of 180. All right, in addition to complementary and supplementary angles, Let's talk about congruent angles. This word congruent is used into geometry to indicate things that have the same measure. So congruent angles have the same measure. This is our symbol for congruent. It looks like an equal sign with a little squiggle in front of that. So if you see that anywhere, don't worry about it. It just means two things that are the same size. We use it for sides, angles, things like that. We use equals for numbers. So. I think I've added something onto my picture here, and I've just moved it a little bit. Let's look at this picture up here. We have this big angle here. We have angle HKJ, and then we have another ray, ray KI, going through it. One thing I want you to notice in this picture is we've got two little markings inside. Those two little markings inside indicate that those two angles are congruent, so I know for sure they're congruent. When you're taking an Ames test or any other standardized test, never assume anything is congruent unless you see a statement like this that says it is congruent, must be written, or if you see marks that tell you in the picture that it's congruent. Otherwise, even if it looks congruent, don't assume that it is. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples that employ these types of properties. In example one, we want to find the measure of angle W, V, X. If angle WVX is congruent to angle YBZ. And here we have a diagram. The very first thing I'm going to do on my diagram is mark what I know. I know angle WVX here is congruent to angle YVZ here. So those two angles are congruent. If they're congruent, that means they're equal. So now I can set up an equation. 12X is equal to 3X plus 45. Solving for x by subtracting 3x from both sides. I'll have 9x equals 45. Divide by 9. I know that x equals 5. Now don't be trapped into thinking that's your final answer, because on a multiple choice test, I promise you that will be one of the choices. 
the question asks me to find the measure of angle WVX. That's here. So I want to plug in X equals 5 back into that expression. 12 times 5 is 60. So the measure of angle WVX equals 60. Let's look at the second expression. Here we have two angles together that form a straight line. So these angles must be supplementary. What was the rule for supplementary? Adds up to 180. So we're going to set up our equation, x plus 48 plus 5x equals 180. And then we're going to solve for x. So combining like terms, we have 6x plus 48 equals 180. We'll subtract 48 from both sides of that equation to give me 6x is equal to 132. Divide both sides by 6. So here we have x equals 22. So then I'm going to find probably the easiest angle first, and that's just found by multiplying 22 by 5, right? That's a little bit easier to do maybe. So 5 times 22 is 110, so that's angle FDG. And that means angle EDF must be 70 because those two have to add up to 180. And in fact, if I check, 22 plus 48 does equal 70. So we're good to go there. Let's talk a little bit about polygons. We're going to separate this into a couple different areas. We'll talk about triangles, quadrilaterals, and then polygons in general. Now, a polygon, you should know, is a closed figure. And all I want to say about that is this is not a polygon. Okay, so if you have to identify anything that is a polygon, you need to know that it's closed and the sides have to be straight. Triangles. Three types of triangles I want you to become familiar with. The first is equilateral, and equilateral means it has equal sides, or three congruent sides, which also means it has three congruent angles. Don't assume something's equilateral unless you see these markings on the diagram showing the three sides are congruent, or that the three angles are congruent, or if there's something else in the problem that tells you it's equilateral. Isosceles, two congruent sides and two congruent angles. And note that congruent angles are attached to the side that is the odd side out, the side that's not congruent. Another way of saying that is the congruent angles are across from the congruent sides. Across like that. Okay. Then we have our right triangles. I know you guys are familiar with right triangles. It's going to have one right angle. And if it has one right angle, that means that the other two angles here must be acute angles. Remember, acute means less than 90 degrees. So we have one right angle. Now, you can combine some of these ideas together, look at the sides of a triangle and the angles of a triangle. You could come up with something like an isosceles right triangle. wouldn't surprise me at all to have a problem that said, in an isosceles right triangle, one of the legs was five centimeters long. Find the other two. So what you're going to do is start by drawing an isosceles right triangle. You have a 90 degrees. You have two congruent sides. And the two congruent sides must be the ones that are attached to the 90 because this third side, the hypotenuse, must be the longest side, so it couldn't be congruent to anything else. This is another property that I've seen several times tested on the Ames exam, and that's the triangle inequality property. And it just says that the sum of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the third side of the triangle. So let's look at a couple examples here. If I gave you 8, 13, and 24, could those be the sides of a triangle? Well, let's look at the two smallest. 8 and 13. 8 plus 13 is equal to 21. Is 21 greater than 24? No, it's not. So these could not be the sides of a triangle. Essentially what's going on here is you'd have, uh, let's say you'd have 8, 13, and 24. It's not quite long enough for that triangle to close completely. Here's another tricky one. 2, 2, and 2, or 1, 1, and 1. Of course this works for the side of a triangle, but it kind of tricks you because all of the sides are the same. seems like it's a trick. But of course that's just an equilateral triangle. And in fact, 2 plus 2 is 4, and 4 is greater than 2. So that one works as well. Let's go over quadrilaterals. Lots of different types of quadrilaterals the basis of which is the parallelogram. We'll talk about that one in just a second. Quadrilateral is any polygon that has four sides. So first of all, a trapezoid 
is a quadrilateral that has one pair of parallel sides only. Only one pair. It can't possibly have two. It could be any pair, top and bottom, or left and right, or it could be rotated in any way. A lot of times when we think of trapezoids, we think of these nice symmetric trapezoids, which are actually isosceles trapezoids, but really they can have lots of different shapes like we see here with that trapezoid. You could even have a right angle in a trapezoid like this. So just be open-minded to how you might see the trapezoids presented. A parallelogram has two pairs of parallel sides. So look for something that tells you it's a parallelogram or look for these little arrows on the top and bottom and that indicates that the sides are definitely parallel. So two pairs of parallel sides. Now, these three figures down below are all parallelograms as well. They're just very special parallelograms. So a square is a parallelogram that has four congruent sides and four congruent angles. Because those angles are congruent, they turn out to be right angles. Now I know you guys know what a square is, but you have to know the definition of a square so that you can identify what type of parallelogram or what type of quadrilateral something is based on given information. All right, now the next one is a rectangle. A rectangle is also a parallelogram, but it only has four right angles, or in other words, four congruent angles. So if you have a parallelogram that has four congruent angles, every single time you know it's going to be a rectangle. And then the last one is a rhombus. A rhombus is a parallelogram, but instead of having congruent angles, this one has congruent sides. So think about it as a square that's been kind of tilted over a little bit, and that's your rhombus. These angles are not all the same. In fact, you can tell this one is big, it's obtuse. This one up here is acute, it's little. Alright, so those are the parallelograms. You need to know the names of those, and you need to know, like, if I give you this information, what's the best name for the quadrilateral? Those are the types of questions that I've seen in the past. Now let's just talk about some names of some other polygons real quick. Ones you need to know, five sides, pentagon, six sides, hexagon, eight sides, octagon. This is the guy that looks like your stop sign, of course, is your octagon. Okay, we'll come back and use these in just a minute. The last thing that I want to talk about for this lesson is interior and exterior angles. Okay, the interior angles of a triangle you need to know always add up to 180. So all three of your angles always add up to 180 no matter what type of triangle you have. Now if you don't have a triangle and you just have some other polygon, the interior angles will add up to a sum of n minus 2 times 180 where n represents the number of sides of the polygon. This is not a formula that you need to memorize. It's one that's given to you on the formula sheet on Ames, but you need to know that you have it and you need to know what it means. So interior angles are always inside of a polygon like this, but an exterior angle is formed when you extend one of the sides of the polygon, and then you get this little outside piece right here. So if you were to extend all of the sides of the polygon, you can see how we have, if it's a triangle, three different exterior angles. If you have three different exterior angles, you can find the sum of them, and this is actually really easy. The sum of the exterior angles of any polygon is always 360. So I don't care how big this triangle is. If this is x, this is y, this is z, x plus y plus z is equal to 360. Not just true for a triangle, true for anything with four sides, five sides, six sides. Those angles always add up to 360. So let's just do a real quick example. Let's find the sum of the interior angles of a pentagon. So I know I'm working with a five-sided figure, so n equals five. I'm talking about the interior angles, so I'm going to use this formula here. So the sum of those angles would equal five minus two times 180, which is three times 180 which is 540. All right, great, so I hope you took notes on this. Bring those notes and then we're gonna practice and apply this in our class after school tomorrow.